Hello and welcome to this lecture on leadership. Leadership is perhaps the most important topic in the study of organizational behavior. Its importance is only exceeded by its complexity. It has elements of the micro level of analysis, the meso level, and the macro level. Great leaders tend to have high levels of certain characteristics, which is decidedly micro. We'll also realize that without followers, there is no leader. So leadership has elements of the meso level of analysis. If we look at a leader, and his or her followers as a team. And of course, we need to consider leadership from the macro perspective when we speak interchangeably of leaders and their organization. For some organizational leaders, they are the company because they founded the company, they own the company, and they run the company. It's difficult to separate the company from the leader sometimes. Let's get started. It is important to define leadership in plain, simple terms. It's not complicated, but leadership is hard to do well. Leadership is helping people do more than they ever thought possible. It's simple. There are no leaders without followers, and the leader's job is to help the followers get things done. In fact, a great leader helps them get more done than the follower ever thought possible. So in the beginning, researchers thought that great leaders were born, not made. The list that they came up with focused mainly on males and mainly on physical attributes. As time went by and researchers got better at measuring non-physical aspects of a person, like intelligence, drive, and personality, and those concepts began to be integrated into the personal attributes theory of leadership. Leaders can be enigmatic and charismatic and narcissistic and everything that it is to be human. But now we can measure those things and see who's who and what's what. Let's move on. Leaders are employees. Employees' jobs are defined by a list of knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics, or KSAOs, that they must bring with them to the job. A leader's job is no different. Let's look at the KSAOs of a leader as validated by empirical research. Leaders tend to have high levels of knowledge about business in general and about the business that they are leading in specific. They tend to know how to get the best out of people by setting up work conditions and designing jobs that allow employees to be highly intrinsically motivated, that is, to motivate themselves. They also tend to know important people in important places, or at least be willing to find them. Knowledge is something intellectually acquired that was not previously held. We know things because we learn things. Leaders tend to have high levels of skills, such as listening skills, emotional intelligence, and interpersonal skills. A leader who is unwilling to listen to the ideas of others will likely miss some golden opportunities. A leader who has not mastered the skill of emotional intelligence will find it hard to understand the emotions of others and to harness those emotions and channel them into a productive capacity. A leader who lacks interpersonal skills will not be able to engage in meaningful interactions with employees and other stakeholders. Nobody likes a jerk, and most great leaders are genuinely likable. These three things, listening skills, emotional intelligence, and interpersonal skills, are all skills because they are things which can be improved upon, and one can indeed get better at them with some effort. Leaders' abilities are centered on general cognitive intelligence, which they tend to have in ample amounts. It is possible for a not-so-bright leader to do well, but it is usually rare. On the other hand, a leader who is unwilling to surround themselves with people who are smarter than they are simply because of their ego will likely not be very successful. Practical intelligence is important because it entails solving novel problems. Smart people tend to be able to solve new problems easier than not-so-smart people, but general intelligence and practical intelligence are not the same thing, and they are not perfectly correlated at positive one. They are not interchangeable, but they are complementary. The other characteristics of great leaders include the personality traits of extroversion and conscientiousness. From the opposite perspective, an introverted slob is not likely to do well in the job of leader. A great leader needs to be active and have an interest in other people. They need to be organized, perseverant, diligent, and hardworking, which are all part of conscientiousness. 
A great leader needs drive to do well, help others do well, and lead a company to excellence. They tend to devote an inordinate amount of psychological energy into the drive to help others do more than they ever thought possible. Great leaders know themselves and have high levels of core self-evaluations, which are emotional stability, self-esteem, self-efficacy, and a strong internal locus of control. If they are any good at their job, they should think well of themselves, that they can do anything if they put their mind to it, and that they should be mentally stable and driven to expand their own personal capabilities. Last on this list, but this is certainly not an inclusive list, is integrity. A great leader usually has a strong moral compass, is truthful, and does what it is that they say they will do. They behave ethically to the point of inspiring others to always do the right thing too. Let's move on. As we know by now, the aforementioned KSAOs all predispose or directly affect a person's behavior. In the case of leader behavior, they accomplish things by two methods, which we can be thought of as dimensions of leader behavior. They engage in people-oriented behaviors and task-oriented behaviors. The former include showing concern for employees and spending time getting to know the employees. The latter include making sure the job gets done and creating an environment or workplace conducive to employee success. Most people actually have a tendency or a preference to engage in one dimension or the other. It's only natural to prefer one or the other. Such preferences are driven by one's particular mix of KSAOs. Some people would prefer to be taskmasters and bark out orders like Pat. Others would prefer to get things done by establishing meaningful workplace relationships like Fran. We all have our preferences. However, it will become clear that great leaders are capable of exhibiting both dimensions of leader behavior as well as knowing when, where, and with whom they engage in people-oriented or task-oriented or both behaviors, maybe like you. In fact, these dimensions are the, founding, are the foundation of almost all theories of leadership. Let's move on. Despite most people having a tendency or a preference to engage in one style of leadership or the other, Fiedler, not Fielder, Fiedler devised a model which will help determine which style is best based upon aspects of the followers and the situation. He calls these combined things situational control or situational favorableness. If we think of it as favorableness, then his model will help determine which style is best contingent upon or depending upon the favorableness of the situation and the follower. Let's look at the three determinants of situational favorableness. First, we have leader-follower relations, which is the quality of the relationship between the leader and the follower. If the relationship is good, then a people-oriented leader may be better. And if the relationship is poor, then a task-oriented style may be better. This is because people don't like to disappoint those with whom they have a good relationship. So a follower who likes the leader will respond better to performance pleased based upon the quality of the relationship. Conversely, a leader who barks out orders and demands strict adherence to their orders will not likely have a great relationship with the follower. A second aspect of situational favorableness is task structure. Fiedler characterizes the task as either structured or unstructured. Think of an assembly line job as a structured task in that there is indeed one best way to do the job and that way has already been determined for the followers. An example of an unstructured task is recovering the debris scattered by a tornado. It's rare that a tornado hits a factory and so there really is no one set way to recover from it as all tornadoes are different and the damage they cause is different. That task has never been performed and there's not likely to be a one best way to do it. The third aspect of situational favorableness is the leader position power, which Fiedler characterizes as either weak or strong. A leader with weak position power usually finds themselves in that position, perhaps only recently. They have not likely built up a coalition of supporters, 
and maybe they're unsure of how to do the job or the job of the followers. A strong position power for a leader is more likely if the leader is also the business owner or has been in that leadership position for a long time or has been promoted to that position because of overwhelming support from followers. Fiedler believes that the predisposition or preference for one style of leadership or the other is so strong that leaders cannot effectively change their style. Thus, all leaders are either people-oriented or task-oriented, and Fiedler says they cannot be both. Because a leader's style is so important, Fiedler developed an instrument to measure someone's leadership style preference. It's called the Least Preferred Coworker Scale, or LPC, Least Preferred Coworker. And it's used to determine a person's basic leadership orientation, either people-oriented or task-oriented. Persons taking this test, or completing the instrument, if you will, are asked to think about someone with whom they work that they like the least. That is, they should think of their least preferred coworker. We all have one or two or even more. Even if you think you absolutely love every one of your coworkers for purposes of this scale, you have to sort of rank order them in preference terms and then think about the one you prefer the least. If scores on this scale describe the least preferred coworker in positive terms, then the respondent is people oriented. If on the other hand, the LPC or least preferred coworker is described in unfavorable terms, then the respondent is task oriented. Fiedler concludes that if you are a task oriented leader and the situation calls for a relationship oriented leader or vice versa, then you can't change your style and you must be replaced with the appropriate leader who has the appropriate leadership style. Ouch. Let's move on. Here we see a diagram of Fiedler's model. Let's dissect it. The three aspects of the situation are listed in the top half of the diagram. Because each aspect or component is dichotomized, we have a two by two by two number of situations. Thus, there are eight situations, and for convenience, they are numbered at the very top of the diagram from one to eight. All of the components of each of the eight situations are in their own columns. For example, in situation one, the leader-follower relations are good, the task is structured, and the leader position power is strong. In, say, situation eight, the leader-follower relations are poor, the task is unstructured, and the leader position power is weak. Let's put some context to one of these situations with the recognition that there are indeed eight situations in total. For example, in situation one, the leader and the followers have been friends at work and outside of work for 10 years. They all genuinely love each other. The task jobs they perform are in an automobile manufacturing plant and are essentially assembly line jobs. Additionally, the leader is the son of the company founder and owner. Good leader follower relations, structured task, strong leader position power. In the bottom half of the diagram are the two leadership styles, people oriented and task oriented. We proceed down each column and find that the X in either the people-oriented or the task-oriented row is appropriate for each of the eight situations. To complete the example of situation one, we see that the X is in the task-oriented row, suggesting that when there are good leader-member relations, the task is structured and the leader position power is strong, then a task-oriented leader is best. Why? Perhaps it's because fostering a relationship with the workers is already complete, the nature of the job is structured, and the leader has a ton of power. There's almost no way that a leader can get these workers to do more than they ever thought possible. They love the leader. The leader is clearly the boss, and the task is the same day after day. If leadership is about helping people do more than they ever thought possible, then the only way to do so in this situation is is to occasionally crack the whip, so to speak. Fiedler concludes that one cannot change their leadership style, so the company must choose the appropriate leader for each situation. If a people-oriented leader finds him or herself in situation one, then they will not do a great job. In fact, if a leader style is not appropriate to a situation, 
either the situation has to be greatly modified to fit the leader, or the leader has to be replaced. There are some shortcomings with Fiedler's model that are worth mentioning. First is that the least preferred coworker scale is a sort of roundabout method of measuring leadership style. There are direct measures of leadership style preferences that are available nowadays. Second is that we should not artificially dichotomize a continuous concept like relationships, structure, or power. Surely we can categorize this relationship as ranging from good to bad and all points in between. Power is not either weak or strong. There are gradations of power. However, Fiedler's diagram does help us understand leadership if in only a greatly simplified format. Third is that there are probably other contingencies that affect the relationship between leadership style and leadership effectiveness. Fourth is that most recent models of leadership suggest that great leaders can and must change their style. And if they have only one style, then they're not likely to be great. Let's move on. Here we see one of the first contingency theories that not only suggests that leaders can change their style, but that it is imperative that they do so. On the axes of the graph, we have the same old two dimensions, people behavior and task behavior. We also see four leadership styles or leader behaviors in the graph, and a great leader can simultaneously use all four different styles with different subordinates or use the different styles with the same subordinate over time. It is sometimes referred to as a life cycle model of leadership because the contingency on which the leadership style depends is subordinate readiness. An analogy with which we are all familiar might be useful. It's a family with children. Let's start with a parent trying to lead their children and get some things done. We start with the telling approach. It is best for very small children. The objective with the telling approach involves large amounts of task behavior and almost no people behavior. The parent says, clean your room. The child says, why? The parent says, because I said so. We are probably all familiar with our parents treating us this way. As the child gets older, say becomes a teenager, the parent then leads them by selling them. The parent still wants them to get home from a party at a certain time or wants them to mow the yard, but now just saying, because I said so, will no longer work. The parent has to convince them to abide by curfew by capitalizing on the relationship with them by saying something like, because I love you and it will make me worry endlessly if you are out later than that. Next in the life cycle, we turn to the participating style. Now we want our adult or college age children's advice on something. We can't make them give us advice. That is, we can't engage in task behavior because I said so, because I will worry are not good enough. Now the parents have to reach out to the young adult and ask them for advice on, say, buying a second home, cashing out a life insurance policy, or revising their will. Lastly, we turn to delegating behavior. The children have moved out and now have children of their own. One day, the oldest child comes home and tells the parents, I have set up a Roth IRA in your name and have made a deposit in it. This was not a result of high task behavior nor high people behavior. This wasn't even a task thought about by the parents. The parents now trust their adult children implicitly and have delegated such matters to them. We can come up with a similar analogy for worker readiness instead of child readiness if we want to. The main point of this theory and other modern contingency theories is that great leaders not only can change their style, but they must change it depending upon or contingent upon many factors. Let's move on. Here we see a diagram of the most well-validated theory of leadership in existence. This path goal leadership model capitalizes on Fiedler's model in that some of the contingencies are germane to the subordinate and some to the work environment. It also capitalizes on Hersey and Blanchard's situational leadership theory because it says that a leader must use different leadership styles 
based upon or contingent upon the follower or employee and the situation or environment. The first path goal leadership style is directive. This is akin to Hersey and Blanchard's telling approach. A directive style is near the far end of the spectrum on high task orientation. A leader tells an employee what to do, how to do it, and when it's due. The second style is supportive and falls near the far end of the leadership spectrum, high on people behavior. A supportive leader gets people to do things by appealing to the strength of the relationship between them. A supportive leader shows they care by listening to the issues and problems of the employee, offering wise counsel to them, and making sure that they are indeed emotionally okay. A third style is participative and very much the same thing as participating in the leader situational leadership model. With this style, a leader gets things done by asking the employee for advice, seeking their input on key decisions, and showing them that they are a valued member of the team or the family, if that's the case. The fourth style of leadership in the path goal model is known as achievement oriented. This style is different than previous styles of leadership that we've discussed. An achievement oriented leader appeals to the need of the employee for recognition and learning. This leader will publicly announce the accomplishments of the employee and will sometimes pay for their advanced training courses. The employee is motivated by accomplishment. The leader knows this and to get them to perform well, the leader appeals to this need. In this model, there is something else that we've not discussed. Leader effectiveness. How do we measure if a leader is effective or not? There are three commonly used ways to determine if a leader's style is effective. The first is employee motivation. We can ask employees if they're motivated to perform well based upon the leader's behavior. Ask them. They'll tell you. If the leader does not motivate them to do more than they ever thought possible, then the leader is ineffective. The second way is to measure the employee's job satisfaction. If they hate their job, then the leader is not helping them perform. People do not tend to do things well that they hate. High levels of job satisfaction are the goal everywhere. The third way to measure a leader's effectiveness is by determining the degree to which the leader is accepted. If a leader has been in place for, say, a year, and a large number of employees are still saying, well, I don't know about this guy or this gal, then they still haven't accepted the leader. Of course, with all things in organizational behavior, leader acceptance is not an either or construct. There are various gradations of leader acceptance and organizations are keen to measure it regularly. We'll talk about the contingencies in the path goal leadership theory on the next slide. Let's move on. Here we see two broad groups of contingencies, employee and environment. We'll discuss the employee contingencies first. Although there are likely to be a multitude of employee contingencies, two are quite useful and valid. The first is an employee's skill or experience. If this is higher or strong, then the best style is a participative style. And if it is low, then the best style is directive or supportive. For example, if an employee is highly skilled or experienced, then they will respond best to appeals for their own insight on the job and their own sense of excellence that they have earned or developed over time. If they're not skilled or experienced, then they need to be told how to do the job with the directive style or shown support and encouragement from the leader in order to cajole them into excellent performance. The second employee contingency is locus of control. If an employee has a strong internal locus of control, then they likely feel responsible for their own behavior and performance. And again, a participative or achievement oriented style is best. They do not need orders to be barked out at them. If their locus of control is external, then they likely do not yet feel comfortable in the role, aren't sure that they will even be able to perform it, and need to be shown how to do it or shown support and encouragement that the leader believes that they indeed can do the job. 
Next, we move to two environmental contingencies. The first is the tried and true structure of the task. This is borrowed from Fiedler. And if the task is routine and structured, then a supportive leadership style works best as the leader sympathizes with the mundaneity of the job and shows concern for the employee. If the task is non-routine or unstructured, then they need to be told how to do the job with the directive style or asked for their own opinion on how to perform the novel tasks of the job with the participative style. The other environmental contingency is the nature of team dynamics. If the team has negative norms, such as all going to lunch together and drinking beer, then the directive style will work best as the leader simply imposes new rules on them. If the team dynamics are positive, as in everyone gives their time to the annual charity drive, then a participative style works best as the leader seeks their input on the best way to do it based upon their own experience. If cohesion is low, then a supportive leader is best as they counsel the team members into getting along better. If it is high, well, researchers are still not too sure which style to use. However, intuitively, I suggest that either the supportive participative or achievement-oriented style will work best, but the directive style will likely sabotage the harmony of the team. When I say, quote, works best, unquote, I mean will lead to or cause high levels of motivation, satisfaction, and acceptance. Let's move on. Here are some tips for business practitioners. First, we should all now recognize that leadership entails two key dimensions, a people orientation dimension and a task oriented dimension. We all have a preference for one or the other. Sometimes the preference is only minor. Sometimes it's a major preference for one over the other. Either way, to be a truly great leader, we have to get the job done through people. We have to master the task and manage the employees, and it's harder than it seems. Second, all people have differing levels of the personal attributes that we covered at the beginning of this lecture. No two people are alike. A great leader must realize that not everyone is going to like them. A great leader is willing to take the adoration with the condemnation. Too much agreeableness or too strong of a need for affiliation can make a leader reluctant to force a follower to do some things that the follower may not want to do. Somebody has to clean the restroom. Somebody has to meet with potential vendors. Somebody has to fix the auto TPS writer machine. Not everyone is willing to do everything. And if a leader insists that everyone like them, then they probably won't be a great leader. Third, a leader has to realize that the number of contingencies that affect a leadership style effectiveness is unlimited. There are some contingencies that make a stronger impact on the relationship between style and effectiveness and a leader must be able to recognize them. Remember that there is no one best way to lead everyone every time. Leaders change their styles as the situation warrants. Fourth, a leader must know their limitations. Some people are able to put their people orientation into overdrive. Others can do the same with the task orientation. Only a few can do both to the absolute maximum level possible. Everyone has their limitations. So a leader must be aware of them so they can seek to manage the contingencies to maximize effectiveness. Fifth, if a leader finds that they're, fall, that they're falling a bit short in the leadership area, then they should get some training. Leadership is a skill that can be improved upon. People can all learn to be better leaders. It is true that some leaders are born with stronger predispositions toward higher levels of the key personal attributes of leadership, like cognitive intelligence or conscientiousness. This gives them an edge. However, many of the other personal attributes, like knowledge of business and emotional intelligence, can be acquired. Additionally, being more forceful when the situation calls for a task-oriented or being more sympathetic when the situation calls for a people-oriented leader can be practiced 
and learned. In short, leaders are neither born nor made. They are both. Let's move on. That's all, folks. Thanks.